Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Heart Talks. If you're new to this series, here I have a conversation with educators in the field of cardiology that I think you should know about. And today, it's a real pleasure to welcome Professor Donald Lloyd Jones from the Feinberg School of Medicine, Northwestern University in Chicago. Don is a cardiologist, epidemiologist, and the immediate past president of the American Heart Association. Thank you very much, Don, for joining us today. Great to be with you, Hafiz. Really looking forward to our conversation. What I wanted to really start off um, talking about, Don, is that last year, under your leadership at the American Heart Association, it adapted its Life Simple 7 to the Life's Essential 8. Can you tell us more about it and how it came about? Sure. So Life Simple 7 was really the American Heart Association's first formal definition of a construct called cardiovascular health. I think, you know, uh, so many of us uh, who are cardiologists are interested in the field. Of course, we recognize what cardiovascular disease is. And I think we have a general sense of what cardiovascular health is, but no one had ever formally defined that phrase and how, you know, how you might actually quantify cardiovascular health. And so back in 2010, a, a group of AHA volunteers um, really did just that, quantified a, a metric of cardiovascular health that it turns out is associated with um, much greater longevity, but importantly, much, much greater healthy longevity. So avoiding those chronic diseases of aging, especially cardiovascular diseases, but also cancer, also dementia, also arthritis, and many other things that can afflict us. So yes, it's called cardiovascular health. It really kind of turns out to be the fountain of youth. And that original definition including included seven metrics, diet, physical activity, smoking, body mass index, cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood glucose. So no surprises there, but when you looked at the package from a positive or health-oriented perspective, um, it really kind of helped us, I think, address um, across the entire age spectrum, how people can try to maximize their cardiovascular health and their healthy longevity. Um, so after 2010, some great science came out and we had the opportunity, as you said, last year to update the concept based on the evidence, based on the science, and so Life's Simple 7 became Life's Essential 8, where we updated the scoring system, but we added a new metric. And that new metric, um, and which I think we're gonna talk about a lot today, was sleep health. Um, and so we really felt that the time had come to add another metric, particularly because the science has, has grown so strong around sleep health. No, oh, absolutely. And certainly an emphasis on prevention, which is fantastic. Can you tell us how is sleep important? And how does a lack of sleep affect cardiovascular health and heart health? Yeah, critically important. Well, you know, first I'll start with, <clears throat> it turns out sleep is really in, intricately linked to all of those other seven factors I previously mentioned. Um, when our diet isn't good or when we eat too late, we don't sleep very well. But likewise, if we're not getting good quality and duration of sleep, it changes the choices we make. When we are underslept, we tend to choose more carbohydrate-rich diets, interestingly enough. But then other things happen. We are less sensitive to insulin, so we tend to gain weight more easily. Of course, lack of good quality sleep affects our blood pressure. As we said, it affects our blood sugar. Uh, it affects so many other things and our ability to perform, obviously, in physical activity. So there's an intricate linkage between sleep and all of the other metrics of cardiovascular health. And so that's one thing to know. But of course, there are direct effects on the heart. And as cardiologists, we see this all the time. People who are under more stress and not sleeping as well, more likely to have extra systoles, maybe more likely to have atrial fibrillation, particularly if they have things like sleep apnea. Um, you know, certainly higher blood pressures can drive other cardiovascular events, both acutely, but of, of course, in the long term as well. So, so sleep is such a critically important factor for our hearts because while our heart is a muscle like every other muscle, this muscle doesn't get to rest. And sleep is so important for the heart to be able to slow down, recharge its batteries, uh, not have to work as hard because our blood pressure dips, our heart rate dips. Um, so it's a, it's a critically important phase of our diurnal cycle to allow our heart to have that, that period of good quality sleep 
when it can be ready for the next day. Absolutely. And how would you define or what is considered healthy sleep? Is it just the duration of sleep or are there other factors involved? It, it really is everything about sleep. It's both duration, but also quality. Now, fair to say that in the current update, we're, we really focused in on duration of sleep because, of course, that's what we can best measure objectively, uh, especially now that we have things like, you know, uh, wearable devices that can tell us the actual amount of time a person is asleep. But um, but I don't want to shortchange the importance of quality of sleep. You know, we mentioned again, you know, individuals who have sleep apnea, particularly if they have pretty severe sleep apnea, they're never getting to those deeper levels of sleep because their brain has to keep waking them up enough to tighten up the tissue in their throat and open up their airway. And we know when that happens, there are surges of hormones, there are surges of neurologic activity that cause the heart to beat faster, the blood pressure to go up, all those things that are detrimental to you know the, the time when we need our heart to be resting. So, so sleep quality is just as important as sleep duration. It's just a little bit harder to measure that. Um, and so we, we did for this uh, iteration, just focus on sleep duration. And the optimal sleep duration for adults appears to be seven to nine hours per night. It's really interesting. I can imagine a lot of people who may be listening to this conversation saying that I feel like I don't need that much sleep. Is the optimal sleep duration the same for everyone? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. And, and of course, the answer is no, not quite. Um, you know, certainly for younger individuals before adulthood, we know, you know, kids and adolescents actually need more sleep. And in the description of life essential eight, we scale it based on the life stage. Um, so seven to nine hours, though, is the general recommendation for adults of all ages. And as we age, we do tend to get less sleep, no question about it. So if you're starting at eight and you kind of uh, get down to seven as you age, you know, that would still be pretty successful. Below that, we all know people who seem to function really well and, you know, don't need uh, less sleep than that. But there may be um, measurable uh, effects on their health as well, even though they don't seem to need that as much. So, yes, we are all different. Yes, there is variability. But I think probably a reasonable thing to target for at least seven hours of sleep per night, uh, but not more than nine necessarily, because again, there's a bit of a Goldilocks here where seven to nine is sort of optimal, not quite as good above nine, clearly falls off below seven. And on that note, so a lot of people watching um, clearly do shift work and mm. particularly in the medical field, do night work and unsociable hours. How can individuals who work night shifts, for example, have good quality sleep? Yeah, I think this is a real challenge for, as you said, medical professionals and, and other people who do shift work. And then, unfortunately, if some people who have to work two jobs or only work the night shift, it can really um, mess up our circadian rhythms. No question about it. We were designed for sleeping when it's dark and being awake for the most part when it's light. Um, I think the important thing for our bodies tends to be a routine. So, you know, yeah, if you're on nights for a week, it's going to throw off your routine. But getting back to that routine once your shift, you know, period is over is very important for overall long term health. Um, so, you know, I think predictability about sleep and our sleep patterns is another important feature here. So, as soon as you can reestablish a predictable sleep pattern, that will be the best thing for heart health and overall health. And can someone train themselves to be a better sleeper? Um, if you could just give some practical advice for people watching who may say, actually, I, I sleep terribly. Um, I'm a night owl. How can they improve their sleep quality and duration? Yeah, I think there are some general tips. But of course, um, if someone really has trouble with insomnia or disrupted sleep, they should talk to their clinician, their primary care doctor, and see if there are things that they need to help them with this. But some very important kind of tips and tricks, I think, are, again, creating a predictable pattern. Weeknight, weekend, getting into bed at the same time, getting up at the same time every day starts to train your body to expect that and then to perform better uh, in terms of achieving better sleep. Not eating too close to bedtime, of course. Um, Understanding that we can't expect our brain and our body to go from 100 miles an hour to zero and go right to sleep. So starting to slow down 
in the hour or two before you're going to get into bed. Avoiding bright lights and stimuli right before you're expecting to get into bed and go to sleep. Because again, you can't expect your brain to just turn off like a light switch. Um, very important, I think, to keep the screens away from our face as we're trying to slow down um, and especially move the phone or whatever it is away from the bed stand, away from the night, you know, the, the bedside table so that you are not getting buzzed or pinged overnight as well. All of these things, I think, can help us to get to sleep, stay asleep and have better quality sleep. Um, and again, all these things are kind of modifiable ways to uh, to um, arrange our environment to help us do that. No, absolutely. And, you know, the key is modifiable. And in many ways, it's so empowering for people watching that in many ways, their health is in their hands. Uh, so on that note, Don, I want to thank you once again for um, taking the time to be here with us today. I know it's going to be hugely helpful for the people watching. So thanks very much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for your time and thanks for doing this. I think it's so important to get these uh, these health-oriented messages out. So best of luck to you and thank you. Thank you very much.